Today on Ham Radio Q&A, I open the mailbag and answer your questions, so please keep watching for more. Hi, I'm Michael, kb 9 VBR, your host for Ham Radio Q&A. Thanks for joining me. I'm on a mission today to inspire and educate the amateur radio community, so if this is your first time watching, please consider hitting that subscribe button. It's February, so we're halfway through winter. The days are getting longer and the sun is warmer. In no time, I'll be pulling the trailer out of the garage and planning some outdoor adventures. But in the meantime, I have uh, to contend with uh, indoor operations. So, but please stay tuned to the end of this video because I'll update you on what's gonna be happening in the coming weeks. But first, now let's get to the questions. I got a few miscellaneous, but really quite interesting questions here. Um, and then we're gonna move into a little bit more in-depth um, talk on my recent video on if snow uh, affects your vertical antenna performance. But first, uh, Gil asks the following question about crossband repeater operation. Will using a repeater that is linked to say 20 other repeaters throughout the state be an issue? And the answer is no, you know, it really shouldn't be an issue. You can cross band into a linked repeater system just as well as you can uh, cross band into any other repeater. I've done that with linked repeaters with fine results. Um, just remember that if you're, when you're cross banding, to wait at least a second when you key up before you start to speak to give both the cross band and the link system time to in engage all of those links. Uh, but really, on a side note, not all repeater owners, you know, may like or appreciate um, cross-band operations on their systems. And that might be especially true with linked oper link system operators, too. They get a little bit more fussy sometimes. So uh, what happens a lot of times is the extra noise of the squelch tail um, that's common with cross-banding, you know, can get compounded. Well, uh, through a link system. So if you're planning to use crossband on a linked repeater system on a regular basis, you should first ask permission uh, from the repeater owners or the trustees before you, before you do that. Another Gil uh, asked a question about using uh, DMR hotspots. And he says, should I leave my DV Mega hotspot powered up all of the time? You know, most of the time it's not used. I leave mine on all the time as uh, energy consumption is really quite low. And if, if you don't want your hotspot transmitting when you aren't listening to it, you can disconnect from the active talk group. This is done by tr uh, transmitting briefly to talk group 4000. To do so, uh, program your radio, your, your DMR radio, to have a talk group 4000 into the contact list of the radio, and then uh, briefly key up to the radio and then um, it will send a code to the hotspot, which will Lovely. disconnect you from the active talk group. Sage just got his technician license and is asking about his certificate of successfully completed exam. He says, can you explain the meaning of the statements on the CSCE paperwork, credit for elements passed valid for 365 days? Isn't the license good for 10 years? Or is there something that needs to be done in that one year window? That phrase is a holdover from the days when um, passing a Morse code test was required for general and extra class licenses. Back then, you could have passed your element three general written test, yet failed uh, the element one code test. Your certificate for successfully completed examination, or CSCE, would give you a 365 day window to pass the code test and complete the upgrade. Nowadays, since code isn't required, the exam credit really is a moot point as you either pass an upgrade or fail and not. But also, um, this, it, the CSCE does let you do well, one additional thing. So say if you've already got your technician license and you upgrade to general, that paper copy, that CSCE copy, is your um, valid proof of completing the exam. So until your call sign is entered into the FCC database, that CSCE is your exam credit. It's good for 365 days, but in reality, it only takes about a week for the VE body to get that paperwork submitted and the FCC um, database updated. So um, in, in one way, it, it's, it's really a holdover from the old days, and another, it gives, well, the VE bodies up to a year to submit their paperwork. Moving on, I received a lot of great advice and information pertaining to my recent video, if snow can affect the ground radio performance of your vertical antenna system. If you remember, um, 
my results from the initial uh, video, the testing was really inconclusive. So I asked the viewers if they had more information and resources that they would share. Uh, the hive mind that, um, that view these videos really responded. And I thank everyone that took the time to give me some direction on where to look for published information. And I'm gonna follow up on a few of the questions uh, from that video, but this really isn't the end of the subject as I'm gonna be continue testing and um, experimenting and researching uh, to, see, to see if I can get a more definitive answer to this subject. Starting out, Ross says, I, enjoy, I always enjoy your videos. One question, with your Wolf River antenna system, how many radials are you using and were they cut to specific lengths for your operating frequencies? Also, does the antenna benefit from being grounded? Now, I'm not sure if I really mentioned in the video on what I'm using for radials, but I, I, I currently have a three uh, ground radials, each at 32 feet long in length. And they're sort of you know out in a star configuration. At this length, how do they tend to work best at the lower at the lower frequencies? Um, but can, they can be a little bit finicky on 20 meters and above. And I do the same thing when I'm portable. I use three ground radials when I'm portable. They're 32 feet long, and, but I do um, roll the radials up to shorten them uh, for a better match on the higher bands. Unfortunately, I can't really do that when they get buried in the snow and ice. So for radio length, you know, a general, um, but for radio length, a general rule is that um, they, are, they should be non-resonant on all the frequencies that you wish to use them on. And then they'll work uh, accept acceptably on those frequencies. As for grounding, I really don't think that additional grounding is necessary for a vertical antenna, especially if you're using a ground radio network. Um, I didn't ground the antenna, although I suppose uh, with it mounted on a fence post, there would be a certain amount of grounding. But you know, even that is tenuous, as this um, as the post is also you know, a little bit rusty and it's painted, so it's going to have um, there's there's not going to be a really good strong ground connection contact there. And we'll talk more about grounding as Claude brings up the following point. This snow subject in radio waves is something I deal with more on a military exercises. You lose transmitting and receiving strength. First of all, um, to do this test for the sake of the viewer's question, an antenna that is tested before the snowfall is grounded. Now try the same test with the antenna not grounded into the earth, but sitting on the snow. Because snow is distilled water, it cannot conduct electrical current no matter if it is wet or if it's dry. This is why we have such a problem in snow without a ground plane. And you, you know, you, um, Claude, you really bring up some really great points. And um, to corroborate that, um, my buddy Joe, who also happens to be an electrician, says, "Shouldn't um, you know? It should actually be worse for ground radiation. That's why Wisconsin requires two ground rods at a service entrance. Uh, when the frost runs deep at the four, uh, the first four feet of the ground won't conduct like thawed ground." And then Joe also re reminded me that RF and 60 hertz electricity, you know, they really act quite, quite similar in nature. So um, if you want to take advantage of ground wave propagation, and the ground wave would be crucial for medium frequency propagation, like 160 meters, then a suitable ground is paramount for cold weather environments. You can either use a ground rod sunk deep into the earth, so you can get good ground conductivity, or you're gonna to have to use a ground radio network lying above the, say above the snow. To this point, um, in another comment I received uh, from, from Joe, a different Joe, uh, he reminds us that AM broadcast band signal ground wave signal strength always appears stronger in the winter months versus the warmer southern summer months. If you have an AM broadcast band receiver with a signal strength meter, uh, you can note either bar or number readings from the summer and then in the winter. In every case, the readings are always higher in the winter, especially with snow and cold weather. It's always been my assumption that medium wave ground conductivity, including 160 meters, is better in the winter. Since you're doing your tests on 40 meters, the effects on snow and the cold you know, may be less noticeable. And that most of my research I found online was geared towards AM and medium frequency operations and not so much on the, um, the, the higher up HF bands. But I think the reason is that, the reason why is that, you know, there is, there is commercial operations on the AM band and that requires a station to operate in a more predictable manner. Which brings me to another comment uh, back from Claude. An excellent source of information is MCRF3-403B, a radio operator's handbook. You can refer to chapter six, 
1-800-GOLF-6, which explains winter operations very well. And thanks for pointing me to that resource. The Radio Operator's Handbook from the U.S. Marine Corps has a wealth of information uh, for HF portable operators. One thing I'm going to point out is that it's written in a very practical manner, so you won't find much in regards to theoretical reasoning, but the manual still writes about cold weather operations. And it states, because of permafrost and deep snow, it is difficult to establish good electrical grounding in extremely cold areas. The conductivity of frozen ground is often too low to provide good ground wave propagation. To improve ground wave operation, use a counterpoise to offset the degrading effects of poor electrical ground conductivity. Remember to install a counterpoise high enough above the ground so that it will not be covered by the snow. So in their manual, they recommend not allowing, the, not allowing the ground radials or the counterpoise to be buried in the snow, but to keep it above the snow. Uh, and, that's also, that was, and that also was for ground wave propagation and not necessarily sky wave. So um, you might have different results if you were trying to work um, ionospheric or skip type propagation. Now I'm going to put a link to this book in the video description below. Reading through it, you know, I think it, it, it really is an invaluable resource to the portable operator, and I'll probably refer back to it again in the future. Finishing up, uh, JP mentions, I would love to see a redo of these tests with bare or non-coated copper or aluminum wire to allow contact with the rain, snow, ice, etc. And really, I'm not done with this subject. I'm going to continue testing and share my results along the way. I'll repeat these tests with um, bare wire radials. I have a bunch of aluminum electric fence wire that should work well uh, for a radio network. I'll also see what, I, um, what kind of results I get. I also plan to test and take readings on other bands, uh, notably 20 and 80 meters, in addition to the 40 meter tests that I've done. Finally, I'll also redo my tests in the spring after the snow melts and, before, and, and when the ground thaws, but before the leaves sprout on the trees. So you're gonna, you can be able to expect a follow-up report uh, later this spring. Before we close down this video, I just want to share what's coming up uh, for this month. I plan to do a follow-up video on APRS with Yesu's FT8, FT3DR. I received enough questions on that to fill up an entire video, so you can look forward to that. Uh, last week I was volunteering uh, at a sled dog race in northern Wisconsin, and I have a video on how that went. Uh, and recently I, received a, I also received a question about power supplies. So that, uh, something on that will be coming up soon in the next couple weeks. But if you have a subject you'd like to see, you know, please leave it in the comments below, and I'll add it to the list. Well, that's it for this month's questions. Please keep them coming. Uh, leave, them in a, leave them as a comment. I'll filter through them, and we'll keep this conversation going. You know, maybe one of your questions will show up on the next Your Questions Answered video. But for more articles and information, be sure to check out my blog at www.jpol-antenna.com. Uh, your support of this uh, channel drives production of future videos, so if you like this video, give me that big thumbs up. Uh, share the video with your friends. Um, leave a comment. Those are all greatly appreciated. And also, please press the subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Pressing subscribe and the little bell notification will inform you when a future video has been released. Well, that's it for this time. I'm Michael, keep it on VBR. Have a great day and 73.